Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Leading Yourself podcast. Once again, I'm super excited to have a special guest with us this week, Mark Hersper. He's the author of the book, The Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You. Welcome, Mark, to the Leading Yourself podcast. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited that we connected in social media. That's how we connect these days, right? And I had not, to be completely honest, I had I was not aware of your book, but I was so grateful we connected and I had the opportunity to get my hands on your book. And I have to make a confession. When I saw the book and the title of the book, being an HR professional, I thought, you were in the HR space, but your background is very unique and something that would have never crossed my mind when I saw your book, I would have never associated you with the background that you have. Can you speak a little bit about, about yourself and your background so everyone, if they don't know you already, can get to start knowing you a little bit more about you? Sure. I think of myself as a dual track professional. I came out of MIT in the 90s with a bunch of degrees in physics and computer science. My graduate work cryptography, that's in cybersecurity. And I started as a software developer and moved up and became a CTO, a chief technology officer. So my day job, my primary job is as a CTO. Now I realized early in my career that to become a CTO, it wasn't just about being the best programmer because there's all these other skills I would need as a leader leadership, communication, negotiation, team building. No one taught me this in school. That's not part of our computer science curriculum or most curriculums. I had to develop it in myself and then realize these are skills not just for executives, but for everyone. So I was also developing them across my teams. Now, I happen to be the de facto HR person at most of my companies. I do startups. I am the person doing most of the hiring. We don't have anyone building culture or doing development, so that would all fall on me. So I've had a bit of HR experience there. But then 20 years ago, MIT was looking at this and getting feedback from companies, and they were saying, we can't find these skills in the people we want to hire. Again, leadership, communication, negotiation, networking, we're not seeing them, not just in students and not just from MIT, but everywhere. So at MIT, we created a program two decades ago referred to as the Career Success Accelerator. And I've been teaching there and elsewhere for the past 20 years, teaching these skills. So I have my job as a CTO, building products and engineering new technologies, but then also doing HR and professional development. What an amazing combination really, but, and I, you know, we see it every day, right? Where in today's world, these skill sets, this technical skill sets that you're talking about are in such a shortage that everyone is hunting for the perfect software engineer. It's probably one of the jobs in higher demand, but also when they get out of school and into the corporate world, a lot of them face challenges that they were never taught at school how to face because of all these skills that you're talking about. And I love that in your book, you broke it like in three sections, right? There's the career section, the leadership management section, and you also have this interpersonal dynamics. Can you speak a little bit on what are these components? Why did you structure your book this way? This way? The 10 chapters are on the 10 skills that we have seen in different surveys to different employers, what are the core skills they are looking for? So these are universal skills across different jobs and industries and even countries. These are universal skills. I broke them into three logical sections. The first is really focused on your job and career itself. Chapter one, career planning, how to create and execute a career plan. Chapter two, how to work effectively. It's not just writing code in my case or creating financial reports, how to manage your manager, how to fend a corporate culture, deal with corporate politics, these things we never talk about. Chapter three is on interviewing. And now there's lots of content on how to be a candidate, how to answer those tough questions, but we generally don't teach people how to hire others, 
how to conduct an interview, but so many of us do that as part of our jobs, even as non-managers. So that's section one. Section two, leadership and management. And so I really break down the essence, what is leadership? And then management, look at the people side of management and the process side of management. I'm not teaching any individual process, I'm teaching the concepts, which really comes down to information flow in modern white collar offices. And these skills, by the way, aren't just for people with certain titles. They are for everyone, because even if you're junior, if you've ever had to convince a colleague, hey, why don't you work on this piece and I'll work on that piece? Guess what? You've just managed someone. You might not have the authority, but you're managing. The third section are really universal skills. This is the interpersonal dynamics, communication, negotiation, networking, and ethics. And these are the skills that underpin everything that we do. Yeah, I when I was looking at it, I'm like, this is so spot on. And I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of research and that went into defining what are these 10 particular ones. But as I was thinking through, and I, these are timeless and they're universal, right? I bet they were relevant five years ago. They're still relevant today. We'll talk about today. How does that look in the future? But also it's all for all functions. You gave the example of software, finance, HR, doesn't matter, even if you're not in the corporate world, if you're trying to start your own business or I think wherever you are, these are really universal. And I think the fact that you were able to narrow it down to 10 that can speak to such a broad audience is impressive because I know working in the corporate world, working in HR, we come up with long list of competencies and skills all the time, but really these ones are that, you know, foundational, universal, applicable to anyone, regardless of where you are in your career, what company you are in, what industry. So it, it, it was pretty impressive when I was reading through it. Thank you. Well, it comes from research like that, which you've done, because I've looked at all this research across the years and said, what is that commonality? What is universal? So this book applies not just for today, but 20, even 50 years from now. And I've been helped through two decades of teaching and getting input from professors and others who are really focused on this full time in their research. Yeah. So let's talk about the future. Because I think, you know, we all had predictions about the future and then the pandemic came and we were shaken up um, and we realized that it's hard to see beyond six months even. We think we know what's going to happen and then another wave of the pandemic came and it has really fundamentally changed the way that we work. It's not only the impact that it has had to the economy and health and personally impacting people, but it has changed the way that we work. A lot of companies are working to more hybrid models, increasing flexibility, a lot of remote work. How do you see these skills fitting into this new, I'm, gonna, I'm making air quotes for those that are listening to the podcast, but this new norm I've been fortunate having worked in tech, I've been working at virtual companies and hybrid companies and all sorts of different models going back 10 plus years, probably closer to 20. So I've had a lot of time to work through this. So this isn't new to everyone, it might be new to your company or industry, but people have been doing this for many years. Here's the way to think about it the nature of our jobs. I'm talking about those of us white collar jobs. If you're on an assembly line, it's different, but I expect most of the listeners were white collar workers. We are all about information flow. The essence of what we do when we manage is that we make sure the right people have the right conversations at the right time. That's really what management is about, making sure the right people have the right conversations at the right time. Now the conversation might be a meeting. The conversation might be sending an email or a Slack message. So we're gonna use this broadly when we say conversation or information. It might be, I have to get you this report versus just give you an answer. But that's what we're doing. We're just moving around information between different people. 
when you look at the world that way, and this is what we talk about in the management chapter on, on process, I'm not saying any one process, I'm saying here's what they all try to do. Then we recognize that as we are in remote teams or semi-remote teams, that changes the nature of our communication. Certainly we all know 10 people sing in a room is a very different experience than 10 people on a text chain. How much information gets through, the bandwidth, the nature of the response. Is it, you, you can't sit there in a meeting and say, oh, I think I'll get back to you in five minutes and sit there silently, but you can on a text. So the dynamics of the information flow changes across channels. And this is important to understand. Likewise, the interaction, um, it, it's still information, but it's not what we formally think of. When we're leading, if I need to stand in front of a room and get everyone really excited, we've got a long three months in front of us, but I'm gonna do that rah, rah, rally speech. I can do it and get people amped up. Doing that over Zoom, you don't feel the energy. It's just not the same. And you can give the exact same speech. You as a leader can give that energy, but it's just not gonna be perceived the same way. It's not gonna be adopted. So we have to recognize the information flow because of the channels that we are now using will be different. And we have to make subtle adjustments to compensate for that. How can someone get to fine tune those adjustments? Like what things to look for to say, you know, because I, I believe that everyone has their best intentions, right? And we all have an intention in mind of what we want to accomplish, what message we want to carry over. But a lot of times it's not perceived by others in the same way that we intended it. And, you know, how, how do you know when you have to adjust or when you need to maybe pick or choose a different channel or if you're restricted to a specific channel of communication, how to adjust that communication? One of my favorite quotes is Hanlon's razor. Never ascribe to malice that which can be explained by mere stupidity. And I agree with you. Most people are trying to do the right thing. We're just sometimes not good at. When it comes to understanding the channels, this is not something you have to figure out on your own. Do it with your team. Now, I recognize you probably have multiple teams. If you are somewhere in middle management, you have the team that you manage, the team below you. Then you have your peers who you might meet with on some regular basis, a meeting of directors. And then of course you're part of a team when you're going up. So you might have multiple teams, but have conversations with them. One common mistake we have, and this will be worse when we are back in the office part-time, when should I walk over to your office versus send you an email versus put something on Slack versus call a meeting? Right? How many times have we heard the, this meeting could have been email? Right. It's because people aren't thinking about, does this need to be a meeting or an email? An email versus chatting with you. When I go over and chat with you, should we have also asked Barbara to join us? Well, Barbara is on the other side of the office, or maybe she's not in today. We'd have to call her. It's just so easy for me to walk over to your desk and just have that conversation. Oh, I guess we'll let Barbara know later. But if we put that extra conscious energy in, you know what? It's you and me and Barbara need this conversation. Maybe we don't need a formal meeting, but let's make sure we involve her. Let me grab you and we both walk over to her desk. That's what we need to be more conscious of. And what we can do is talk to other people and say, what are some of the areas where you see it's not flowing as well or it feels off or different? What do you, my boss, my uh, subordinate or my peer, what do you think we can do differently? And have these open conversations with folks and work on it together. Because if you come up with the right answer, but no one else does, if you realize Slack is the best way for this message and email for that, but other people don't see it that way, it's not going to help you. Right. Right. And I think also, for me, one thing that is very helpful is just being clear on what is the intention that I have with that communication, right? A lot of times we communicate in a certain way or in a certain channel that because it's what we always have done or what we did last week. And we defect to that. But a lot of times it's a matter of taking a pause and just thinking, first of all, who should be involved? Do I have all the key stakeholders? And 
what is really that I'm trying to accomplish? Because a lot of times, if you answer some of those questions first, it will be more clear as to what is the best channel or the best way to reach out and bring these people together. You bring up one of the topics in the book is the parable of the five gorillas. There's this story about a researcher who puts five gorillas into a room and in the middle of the room, there are some steps suspended above the steps are some bananas. So one of the gorillas looks around and says, oh, I think I want to get these bananas and walks over and starts to climb the steps. As soon as he touches the steps, the experimenters blast every gorilla with a fire hose of ice water. Well, pretty soon they all learn, don't go near the steps, simple Pavlovian response. In the next phase of the experiment, the researchers remove one of the gorillas, put a new one in. So this gorilla looks around, sees the bananas, heads towards the stairs. But the other gorillas, knowing what's going to happen, they stop him. They're pulling him back. This gorilla's undeterred. They just start wailing on him. They start beating him to say, don't go near those steps. We know what's going to happen. So this guy learns, okay, for whatever reason, I'm not touching those steps. When it's repeated another time, another gorilla is removed. And so all these gorillas, including the new one from the last round, go over and start beating this one to teach him, don't go near the steps. And one by one, the gorillas are removed until in the final phase, you have the last of the original gorillas is taken out and a new one walks in. And when he heads towards the steps, the four other gorillas just start beating him to keep him away from the steps. But no one actually knows why. None of them were around to get hit with the ice water. They were just taught, this is what you do. And that's why they keep doing it. This is what we do in corporations. And the irony is those gorillas don't have wikis or emails or post-it notes to write down, don't touch the steps because of the water. We just do it this way because it's easy, because we have so many other things to deal with, new customers and all these other changes. I don't want to think about, do we really need the same meetings this year as last year? We just go on autopilot. But taking some time to step back and say, let's rethink this. Do all these meetings still make sense? Should some of these meetings become emails? Or should some emails become meetings? And really stepping back and doing that, I would recommend on a regular basis, but even if you don't, this is the time as you go back into the office, start from that clean slate, start by saying, what is the information flow we need? And then what's the right process for doing that? And you're going to be in a much better position than your competitors. Absolutely. And it doesn't take that much of a time. I think it's a it, it's a investment that you make up front, but then it's going to save you so much more time afterwards. We're always concerned about, we don't have time to discuss these things. We don't have time to get together because as you said, we have customer demands and other meetings and other priorities. But a lot of times taking just that little time and put that investment up front can pay big dividends in the future. Absolutely. And we've all experienced this personally. How many times have you maybe run late to a meeting and you have to present and you can either just run right in and go on and you're kind of frazzled and discombobulated. We say, okay, I know I'm running late, but I'm just going to take a minute. I'm going to be a minute later. I'm already late, but it's okay. I'm going to take another minute just to compose myself just to make sure everything's set up, just to flip again through my notes, whatever it is, you know your outcome is going to be better, even if you're another minute late, than if you just rushed into it. And that's where we are with our companies. We're always behind. There's always too much to do, but taking that breath is going to help you refocus and be more efficient, as you said. Yeah. Now, let me switch gears here to another of the skills that you mentioned in your book, because I... I'm really curious at what is your perspective on networking in the current environment? You know, in the past, when I think about networking, the first thing that comes to my mind is a big in-person event with a lot of people, right? And where, you know, you get to meet people, connect with people. And since we were all pushed to work virtually or avoid, you know, groups, large groups of people, we haven't had really the opportunity. And what I found is a lot of people have put networking on the back burner, using maybe the pandemic as an excuse 
I, I'm saying excuse. I mean, there's real reasons why we're not going to those big events, but there's other ways to network, I personally think, but I'm so curious on what is your perspective on this one in particular? I have been saying for the past year, almost year and a half now, COVID has been a gift to networking. It's horrible for many other reasons, mm -hmm. but for networking, it's been a gift because most people do have that image that you describe. You walk into a room, you shake hands with a bunch of people, collect a bunch of cards. Look, I just met 20 people in the last hour. My network's grown by 20. It hasn't. Not really. Right? <laughs> when people say, oh, I've just added all these new people on LinkedIn. Look at how my network's growing. Saying that someone you added on LinkedIn is in your network, that's like saying someone you just swiped right on Tinder is now your significant other. That's not how it works. Oh, look, I just swiped right. We're, we're practically married. No, it just means there's a little bit of interest. Now, what do you have to do? You have to actually go on dates and build the relationship. Same thing is true in our professional relationships. Getting a business card or connecting on LinkedIn doesn't create the relationship. It just means you exchange low information. I know how I get in touch with you now. Relationships come from repeated interactions, from building trust over time. Now, the reason COVID has been a gift for those who recognized it is twofold. First, we actually had more time. If you spend 30 minutes a day going to and from work, 15 minutes each direction, and you're probably lucky if you do that, suddenly you had an extra 30 minutes a day. Imagine if you just said one morning per week, I'm going to reach out to someone in my network. I'm going to basically have virtual coffee with someone. And that's an extra meeting per week where you can build a relationship. That's extra time we have for doing it that we didn't think of beforehand. <clears throat> the second way it was beneficial is because we think of meetings in person. Traditionally, hey, let's meet up for coffee. Well, that's great if we're in the same city, but if we're on other sides of the country or different continents, not happening. And if in 2017, I called you up and said, hey, let's have coffee over video on our laptops, I said, what are you talking about, Mark? That's weird. Mm -hmm. But now it is normal. And so we've had the opportunity to really reach out and build connections with non-local people. So yes, one tiny piece of networking, the meeting a stranger, shaking hands and handing out cards definitely took a hit the past 18 months. But every other piece of networking, there was an opportunity to really go further. And you just had to change your mindset from collecting cards to building relationships. I love this because I cannot agree more. Um, you know, I'm an introvert by nature. So for me, even going to these big networking events to begin with is intimidating, right? Like it's totally putting myself outside of my comfort zone, totally intimidating. Um, and I always say when we talk about this topic of networking is if you want to become better at networking, if you really want to grow your network, you need to start with the network that you already have, right? Like is what you said, the fact that you're connected with someone in social media, in LinkedIn, in, in your company's intranet, or you have exchanged an email doesn't mean that they're part of your network. It only means that you had one point of connection. And if you don't nourish that relationship, you can't say that that person is part of your network. Like if you and I would have met on one of these networking events that I was talking about, and a month from now I call you and I, I, to ask, Mark, I have a favor to ask from you. You're gonna say, who are you? And I'm like, oh, we met in that networking event. And you might remember me, but that doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're an active member of my, of my network, right? So I can't agree more with you. And I think it's a shame that a lot of people had put networking on the back burner thinking that there wasn't the opportunity to network. And I think that those that put networking as a priority really have seen how their network has strengthen. I wouldn't say grow maybe, but strengthen. And to your point of meeting people outside of your geographical area, how true is that? Like I've attended a lot of virtual events. I've met people that otherwise I wouldn't have made because as you said, 
before the pandemic, if they would have told me less meat for a virtual coffee, I would say, you're weird. <laughs> I mean, I meet for coffee at my local Starbucks or my local coffee shop, but meeting over a computer. And now, you know, I wish I had buy some Zoom stocks before the pandemic. <laughs> exactly. This, this is becoming normalized. And so as we go forward, we are going to start going back to those in-person coffee meetings because we miss them. We miss right. seeing people in person. And that is always preferable to be in person, but we can find some of each. We can do those in-person meetings and we can do some of the virtual meetings and keep those connections with remote people. Yeah, and sometimes doesn't have to be even a lengthy one. It's just a matter, one thing that I like to do every month, um, you know, I set goals for the month, I set intentions for the month, but one thing that I do is I write down three people that I want to connect that month. Typically are people that are already on my network that maybe I haven't talked to in a while and I want to check in with them or someone that I know is working on a specific project that it's that we have mutual interest on or whatever the reason is, but I identify three people and I make my purpose to connect with those three people. And it might be sending them a text and say, hey, I was thinking of you, how are you doing? Or I heard you're working on this project, how is the project doing? And that just opens the door for continuing the conversation, right? And and I think that also shows the other person that you're generally interested in what they have to say, because that's the other thing. Sorry, I'm rumbling here and jumping from one thing to the next. But the other thing, I took a lot of networking courses in my life. And one thing that I always heard is you need to have an elevator pitch that you can tell someone when you meet them in this big event. And I'm like, it's just me or this is so awkward. Like, meeting a stranger and, you know, saying out loud my elevator pitch. It, it, it didn't sound natural, right? For me, when, when I think about networking, it's more about listening than talking and asking questions and, and so showing that interest in, in learning about the other person. You are spot on. And there are a number of techniques I go through in the book about how you can actually do that outreach and how to do not elevator pitches. I figure everyone's heard of that. But I've talked about other ways you can initiate the conversation. But a basic thing you can do, we're thinking, how do I reach out to this person? Look at their social media, look at their recent posts or status. And that is something where you can reach out and say, hey, I see you just got a new job or hit your work anniversary. Or I noticed you were tweeting about this. I was just reading an article on the topic. Maybe you're interested. It's very easy to find a way to reach out because people are broadcasting what is important to them. Yes. And then you have a better way to break the ice than talking about the weather. Absolutely. Okay. So switching to a different skill in your book, um, which also I was, maybe is my HR background, but I'm like, career plan. I think also it's one that I see a lot of people, when we were forced to change the way we're working and going more into this hybrid models or remote work, everyone was so worried about just being productive, just being able to do their jobs to the best of their abilities in the new circumstances, right? And trying to adapt to that, that a lot of people had put their careers in a parking lot um, maybe not this year, but certainly last year. So when, when you think about a career, a lot of these other skills that you mentioned in your book, like the communication and networking that we were just talking about, play an important role in growing your career. How do you see that one playing off in this environment? How do you go about approaching a career plan in this new normal? I don't think it's necessarily any different now versus before. Hopefully more people are more conscious about doing it. The career plan is really, it's like a project plan. You would never do a year long project without having some type of project plan. But your career is a 10 year long, maybe even 30 year long project. How can you do that without a plan? 
Now we know when you have long projects, they're not going to go as planned. And what you're doing in the next month needs to be a little clearer than what's happening six, 12 months down the road. That's how we think about their careers. That's how people should think about their careers. It's that you have your near term is a little more concrete and your long term is fuzzier. Now, these other skills in the book, there's a reason I put that first, because your career plan might be, I need to improve my network. I need to work on my leadership skills. And so you'll fold those in to next two years, I'm going to work on my network. Year five to seven, I'll work on my leadership. I'm not going to worry about how I'm going to do that. That's just on the to-do list for later. But today I'm focusing on my network by having a virtual coffee once a week or reaching out to three people per month, whatever your process is. So we're going to be more focused on our career plan. Now, one thing that I do when I teach career plans is I provide a list of questions. These are in the book. They're also free on my website. Most of the questions are not about your job. There are some, but they're also about your life your family planning, where you want to live, your lifestyle, because these questions help determine what matters to you. If it's always important to you to have dinner with your family, choosing a career where you're going to be spending lots of time on the road is probably not a good fit. So we have to recognize our life goals really help form what our career opportunities are, and we can pick a career that works for our life goals. I think that is, I'm glad that you brought that up because I think it's so profound, right? And it seems common sense, but it's not actually common practice. We look at our personal life and our career life as two separate things, right? And we think about our career and a lot of people, I mean, we're all driven by different things, right? It could be impact. It could be title. It could be um, compensation. There's many things, right? But then you have your, your personal goals. And I think it's always important to put these mirror of this two and see where do they overlap? Because it's in that space that is your sweet spot for determining what you want to do with your career. Because if you might have the best remuneration, the title that you always wanted, but if you're not, if you don't have that sense of centeredness between your personal life and your career. I don't like the term balance. That's a topic for a whole other conversation. But if you don't feel that you can fulfill your priorities in both, you're gonna end up frustrated and burnout. Absolutely. Common sense is remarkably rare. And so what seems obvious, people haven't focused on. I do think now during the great resignation, people are starting to ask these questions and saying, what do I want to have life? And does this particular job or even career serve that purpose? So finally, people are starting to think about it the right way, but you have to think about your larger life and then find a career that fits into that. Yeah. I also think the pandemic has is one of the blessings of the pandemic, right? That it has opened our eyes of what it's possible and it has opened our eyes to reevaluate our priorities. A lot of times we go with our day to day and again, back to your story of the gorillas, right? It's just what you do all the time. So you keep just doing the same. And I think the fact that we have been taken out of that normal state quote unquote, it has opened our eyes to say, oh, maybe there are other things in life. Maybe my priorities are different. And I think this is a great opportunity to revisit that career plan if you already have one. And if you don't have one, leverage all all what has happened in the last 18 months to reflect upon those questions that you have in the book and really start putting your plan together. To your point, what many people do is they have some idea at 22, 25, what they want to do, and they start doing it, but they're so heads down and they're the gorillas who say, well, this is what I'm supposed to do and I'll keep doing it. And they don't step back and say, is this still making sense? Is this still what I want to be doing? And so they turn 35 
say, well, I, I'm just doing it because that's what I'm supposed to be doing. That's what I've done the past 10 years. And they don't ask, is this still what I want to be doing? So the pandemic, to your point, is where we're finally getting that pause of you're almost in a trance going through the motions and you just wake up and say, wait, wait, am I doing the right thing here? And I hope people not only do that now, but recognize for themselves and teach to future generations, you need to be asking these questions on a regular basis. And in the book, when I talk about creating a career plan, just like on your project plans, you have a regular check-in. How's the project doing? Are we on schedule? Are we behind budget? What's going on? Do the same thing with your career. Do that check-in. Even if it's just once a year, how am I doing? Am I still going in the right direction? Am I on schedule, off schedule? Does the schedule not even make sense anymore? Mm -hmm. And that's going to prevent you from going to this autopilot and finding out 10 years from now, you just went down a path and realized that's not where you wanted to go. Yeah, so true. Talking about this questionnaire, I know this is one of the resources that is available in your website. And I can be talking for you for hours, but I know we have limited time. So before we wrap up our conversation, um, please share with our listeners, how can they find out more, where they can get your book, how can they contact you, uh, where they can find some of these resources that we've been talking about today? You can get my book in the usual places, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Apple Books online. You can also find them in local bookstores. They can order them for you if you want to support local bookstores. If you go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com, there you can get in touch with me, follow the blog, follow me on social media. You can see where to buy the book. You can also get access to a number of resources. There is a free app that comes with a book, or you can even download if you don't want the book. If you go to the app page on my website, it will take you to the Android and iPhone store where you can download the app. Each day, it's going to give you a little reminder from the book. If you went through the book with a highlighter, here's a good tip, here's a good quote, here's a key point. That's what's gonna come up every day as a single notification. Just, you don't even have to open the app. You pop it up, go, all right, that's a good point. Swipe it away and you're done. That's gonna help you retain the content in the book using a technique known as spaced repetition. It's also helpful, by the way, if you're about to go into that networking event and you think, ooh, I'm, I'm pretty rusty, we'll open it up and go to the networking tips and just flip through them and get that kind of quick refresher. So you can do that for any of the topics. So you have the app. There's also an entire resources page. I link to other books if you wanna go deeper. I link to some free online resources if you wanna go deeper on those. There's also a number of downloads. I mentioned the career questions are completely free. There's also a development guide for HR and executives. If you want to create a training program to teach these skills, whether you use my book or other resources, it's a free download and teaches you how you can develop these skills across your whole team. So all of this, the downloads, the app, following me on social media, where to buy the book, all of this you can find on my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. And we will include the link on the show notes of this episode. So you can just go there, click, and it will take you directly to the website. And talking about the app, I downloaded the other day and I love it. And sometimes it pops a question that makes you reflect and think about something that was in the book. And, and those, I have to confess, are my favorite. That is helpful feedback. We're going to have to add some more questions to the app. Yeah, I think, you know, I personally, for me, I know we all learn in different ways, but I am a firm believer that self-reflection um, is the most powerful tool to create self-awareness, which is the foundation for personal and career development. So um, I love the app. I think it was genius because, you know, we were talking before the episode, you read a book, you move to the next book and then to the next book. And two weeks later, or even a week later, you don't remember what you read. Um, we are we live in a society that we're bombarded with so much information from anywhere that is so difficult to retain it. But the good and the part that I love about the book is that it's completely actionable. It's not one of these theoretical books with principles that you read and you will end up forgetting after you read. Um, 
but not only will it inspire you, but it will give you practical advice that you could put in practice the day after that you read the book. Or even what I like to do is read one chapter, identify one thing that I can apply, go ahead and apply it. And once I apply that thing, move to the next chapter and build upon. That's, I find for me, the best way to develop really the skills and not just glance through, through the book. Absolutely. And you can read the chapters in any order. You can jump right ahead if there's a particular skill you want to address. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. As I said, I could keep talking for hours and hours. So maybe I'll reach out and invite you back again to the podcast to continue the discussion. I would love that. For everyone listening, make sure that you check uh, the website on the show notes of this episode, check out the book, download the app. Even if you don't get the book, get the app and you'll see how helpful it is. Check out all the free resources and make sure you connect with, with Mark. Mark, thank you so much. Hope you have an amazing day and everyone listening also have an amazing day. We'll see you again on another episode of the Leading Yourself podcast.